Hello and welcome to The Voices Project. I'm Liz Barker and I'm joined by Becky Webb and together on this podcast we talk to people about their experiences of the arts during the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis of 2020. We ask people how they got into the arts, what the arts means to them, what it's been like during lockdown and what they think the future holds. Today we are joined by Andy Doherty, who is the Managing Director of AdLib, an audio, lighting and visual hire, sales and installation company that he founded in 1984 with just a PA system and a transit van. Andy built AdLib from the ground up and the company now employs over 160 full-time members of staff and works on large-scale events, including many international music tours and large festivals. He has also been a key organiser for the action group, We Make Events. Like everything in this pandemic, the podcast is recorded over remote video conferencing software. This podcast was recorded on Wednesday the 19th of August, so any dates mentioned are in relation to then. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Andy. I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and about AdLib and about the journey over the last 35 years that you, you and this company have, have gone on and how we got to where we are today. Hi, Liz. Hi, Becky. Yeah, um, AdLib started um, as a company in 1984, but even prior to that, I'd been working with uh, one of my friends at school who was uh, in a band and then kind of followed that through, wound up buying little bits of equipment um when they all were because they were all clever they all left and went to college i went and got a job instead as an electrician um using that finance buying a few more bits of equipment as i went along the way uh got made redundant in 1984 when i was about 23 at the time i think and that's when i started ad lib on a what was then government enterprise allowance thing which was a massive 40 quid a week for a year uh, to help uh, instigate people to start businesses and to be fair it was quite literally that sort of little transit van, a uh, bit of gear, working with local bands for a period of time that then developed and developed and developed. Um, and uh, at this moment in time, we have 167 full-time staff here, but my background was always about mixing live bands. Um, and then uh, in later years, I suppose, as the business grew and grew and grew, I had less opportunity to uh, go out because I had to spend had more commitment back uh, at AdLib. And then also the technology changed very, very quickly, and I didn't. <laughs> so when we went from, from uh, analog into the digital world, I kind of slowed down quite a bit at that point as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, as I say, 36 years of history, some uh, incredible um, artists that we've looked after over that period of time. One of my favourites would have been um, 2003, we did David Bowie's last ever tour, which was the reality tour, which was pretty much all over Europe. And in the, you know, up to today where we have some massive major artists that we're looking after all the time uh, and all the big festivals. And um, one of the big things that I I do enjoy today is seeing the amount of youngsters that come into the industry that we'll have an arm around and nurture them through and see where they get to, um, which is always good. But yeah, that's that's a bit of a potted history. Amazing. So obviously with your your work and what you do it's so vital it's about people coming together and obviously the pandemic has done one thing very very strongly for all of us across all parts of live entertainment and live arts which is that people can't can't come together and obviously we've gone into lockdown and we've been told formally we can't do things how has all of this sort of affected your company and yourself what's what's the implications of lockdown on restrictions what's all that doing for you uh, well, if we go back to the 23rd of March or whatever the date was that the, the lockdown was announced, at that time, we had numerous tours out all over Europe. So Kaiser Chiefs, The Script, um, Pussycat Dolls was about to go out. Um, I can't remember the rest off the top of my head. Um, but there was, there was numerous tours out and about at that time. One, actually, a comedian, American comedian called Steve Martin, we were looking after around the UK and Europe, and he literally managed to get the last flight back to the States, like disappearing incredibly quickly from watching. You know, our guys have loaded in, set up, and it's like, sorry, Steve's gone, it's, it's, uh, it's out of here. So it was, it was instant, and it was, um, it was like a light switch going off. Um, and the 
tours that we had out at that moment of time would have led us quite beautifully into festival season, which is everyone's biggest season. I mean, I think we normally do 50% of our annual income over that three month window through festival season. Um, and from an ad lib only perspective, from the middle of March to the end of August, there was eight million pounds worth of confirmed work that disappeared, with potentially another two that we believe would have been confirmed. So, from an ad lib only perspective, if you multiply that by the rest of the industry, it's massive. But from ad lib only, it was about ten million pounds worth of work cancelled in that window of time. Um, and Obviously, the, the thing through that, at that point, nobody had any idea as to how this was going to play out. I think everyone thought we'd be back in by the autumn, no problem at all. Um, and we saw everything that we were doing in the spring rescheduled to the autumn. And now we've seen everything in the autumn pretty much shoved back into um, next year. And, and people are going for the back end of next year. that are being a little bit nervous about how quickly we will be returning to work and and as you say the issue that we have of course is that um mass gatherings aren't allowed and we shouldn't be fooled by the government saying that theatres are now open because 20 percent you know that's that's sorry that's about um one meter social distancing we're still looking at about 27 to 30 percent occupancy most theatres uh, unless they're funded in some way, shape, or form, need to be at a minimum of 80% occupancy to break even. So nowhere is going to open up to lose even more money. So, so consequently, we are not returning to work until such time as mass gatherings are allowed. Um, and I think that's that's something that there's there's this oh yes, theatres are now open. They're not unless you just want to pop into the cafe a bit for a tea or a coffee. You certainly won't be seeing a production in there, you know. So. That's, uh, that, that, that's the, the main things, I think, at the minute. It's like there is no sign of a return to work at the moment. And that obviously, does that have a big effect on AdLib as a company? Because as far as I understand it, you guys, you don't produce your own shows, but you support a lot of what everyone else is, is doing in terms of when a theatre building can't open, OK, they've got their own internal staff, but that are just dependent on that core bubble. But yourselves as a company, you're dependent on all of these external bubbles also functioning for yourself as well. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, there are a few sides to Adelaide, but regarding certainly the live production elements of it, our clients come from different places. It can come from the venue. It can come from um, a promoter. But inevitably, it comes from either the band, the band's production team, so it might be the tour manager, the production manager, um, and, and that equates to most of what we do or working very closely with the promoter. Um, so I think that, you know, from a, a, from a public perspective, um, we're kind of invisible. And in, even in one of my past statements, I think we're, we're invisible and undervalued, which is why um, I, I think we're having such a, a difficult time being recognized. Most of the people who do what we do love what they do, they, they, they love the vibe of it, they love the excitement of it, you get the hair standing up on the back of your neck, but none of us want to be actually be on the stage. That's why everyone's dressed in black and hidden. And now all of a sudden we can't be hidden anymore. We need to be coming to the front and we need to be seen and we need to be heard. But it's not natural. It's not natural for any of us to be that person. I mean, I'm doing a bit of it, but oh my God, is it something that's out of my comfort zone, you know? Um, I'm doing a bit of it, and there's a few, fair few others now who are coming to the fore just to state the case. But it's not natural for people. We do what we do because we love the vibe of it, but we've never wanted to be that centre of attention role. And it's the technology elements of it, and delivering the show is the bit that excites us. The problem is, is that the people go and see a band. So when they go and see a band or an event, it's the band and the event, and it's all part of the artist that you've seen. So where we exist in, in their world is, is non-existent. We're just part of the band, or possibly some people may even see us as part of the venue. They don't see us as our own section that sits in the middle. And if you think about that um, supply chain, before we go into the ins and outs of all of the, the, of the bits that go into the production element of it, but if you just go from an artist to the production company to a venue, if any one of those three is missing, you haven't got a show. So at the minute, we're looking after the venues, 
The artists, a lot of them are pretty self-sufficient, which is fine for now until the point comes, but they can make money on downloads. They can still record and put stuff out. But the production sector that sits smack in the middle of it is reliant on live performance. And that can be anything from the music side of it to the corporate side of it to even sports. All of these events have a lot of sound, a lot of lighting, and a lot of rigging and production elements attached to it, which is a lot of staff and a lot of people who are currently beginning to panic about how and when and what and why. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of people involved and a lot yeah. of people worried. I remember watching the video of the We Make events. It was something like 500 people makes a production and it's, it, it's unreal how, yeah, it is invisible, but how vital it is and how many and how many in so many different jobs that you just wouldn't even consider. No. And it's, it's getting that awareness of like, you know, the, these are the vital things, you know, without it, I don't yeah. know, like I report, without it, we're just performers in the dark. Yeah. That is what we are. We're just people stood on a dark stage, not been with nothing. Yeah, it, so. It's going to be a very quiet and a very dark show if we don't, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, and, and I do think that that's a message that needs to be got out. The public needs to understand the importance of our sector and, and its roles. And in some respects, it's absolute testament to everybody in this industry that they don't know we exist because it means we've done everything we've done for all these years phenomenally well. The only time you know we exist is when something's gone wrong. And more often than not, that's the technology, not the individual that's caused that issue. You know, so yeah, um, yeah I think I think it's a testament to all of us that. We are as invisible as we are or as we have been. But, you know, there's 600,000 to a million people pending on seasonality that need to be um, recognised right now. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you mentioned the, the, the We Make events, Becky. And obviously, Andy, you've been really, really uh, involved with the, the We Make events Day of Action, but also the We Make events uh, group and how that is progressing forward. I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that, about the, the sort of Liverpool Day of Action that, that Becky and I were at um, mm -hmm. and, and how that's where that's come from, what it is and, and sort of where it's potentially going a little bit, what you can tell us. OK, so the, the We Make events things really come from a collaboration um, instigated by Plaza and the PSA. So Plaza is the Professional Light and Sound Association, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of. And the PSA is the Production Services Association, which I'm also sure you're aware of. You know, the people working in those organizations at the minute are absolutely flat out. They're doing a phenomenal job for everybody. I approached them um, very early doors on this. And uh, as I was sitting on the DCMS steering groups thing, and at that stage, they were working together, which I was quite pleased about. Um, and I thought, yeah, this is all going in the right direction. Having sat on the DCMS panels for a period of time, I realized um, not so long ago, probably six weeks, to, six weeks to two months ago, that actually the agendas were being a little bit different between what the DCMS group as a collective were coming up with and what the requirement was for um, another huge amount of people that were being um, represented by the DCMS. And that's when uh, we went back to the likes of Plaza and the PSA. And it was like, look, guys, I think we're going to need to um, have a look at this uh, a little bit more, take a little bit more upon ourselves. And then out of that, those groups pretty much got started to get together a group of industry um, renowned characters who've all been in it for a long time, some of you much, much bigger. Um, organizations, your bigger groups, your bigger uh, representat representatives who've now come together to form this sort of um, mass group of about 100 people sitting in on it, all of which are pretty much top of the tree, um, all of which are coming together in a way that actually is unique. You know, I've got rival companies you're bidding against all year round who are now brothers in arms while we're, 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 we're fighting the good fight, you know. and um, and it's an absolute testament to everybody involved. And you know, just to echo what we said before, these are people who don't like, really like to be seen to be out there and, and, and putting themselves forward for anything, but you know, needs must at the minute. And I don't think people truly appreciate how critical uh, danger that this, this sector is, is in at the minute. So where, where we make events sits is, um, it's all these major groups of people coming together. It's currently forming, um, 
uh, a lot of work groups, um, which will be announced early next week, and targeting things in, in new ways, fresh ways. It's coming out with its phase two initiative, if you like. And I would um, encourage you to, to, to watch that space. I mean, at this moment in time, there's nothing finalized as to how and what, but it will be by Friday. So I don't want to release too much at this point in case it changes and I look even more daft than I normally do. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll keep that one under wraps for the minute. But yes, you've got a lot of people who are big in this industry who are coming together for the greater good. Um, and with that, you know, the, the whole We Make Events thing, um, a gentleman by the name of Gary White is a production manager who looks after things like um, New Year's Eve and in London. So understanding all the river police, all the normal police shutting the place down, social distancing, da, da, da. that man pulled that whole London River Thames thing together in something like 20 days, which was absolutely ridiculous what he managed to achieve in that. But he did it because of the cooperation and the coordination of all the other major, major companies that were involved. So again, for our industry to pull that together as an awareness day, so it was a kind of hashtag, the red alert, but and we make events day is just to sort of get it out there or to, that was phase one it's almost like reaching base camp now we're okay we may have a little bit of publicity we may have a little bit of press but the job really starts now um, and I think that's what that day was all about it's about announcing our arrival in some respects but it's it's just the tip of the iceberg it has to be you know we now have 74 days to be able to um, create a really big noise and hopefully some results. And those results can be as simple as when can we go back to work because it helps people plan. So We Make Events is, as I say, a, a, a huge conglomeration of lots of uh, bigger organisations and that's companies as well as, as trade organisations um, actually really having a, a proper go. So, you know, I, 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 all I can say at the end of all this is if nothing's been achieved by the end of this, then it won't be through lack of effort, you know. Um, it will be through um, an amount of ignorance as to what our sector actually is. And I think I think that word ignorance is, it really does sum up a lot of the reaction I tend to get when I try to talk about this to people. And I know, Becky, you probably experience it likewise, that actually there are the vast majority of the, the public, but also a lot of politicians that I know we've been talking to, that you've been talking to as well, who just don't really appreciate the scope of what we do. They see the show or they come to the gig or they, they watch the live stream or, and they, they see that one moment and they think, God, that, that was amazing, but that's what they did. But they don't see the community outreach that we do. They mm -hmm. don't see the sort of weeks of production pre uh, preparation that we put in. They don't see all these little cogs that make the big machine actually look like the big machine. Now, I know that um, you were saying to us just before we sort of started that you, you as, um, at AdLib as well, you do a lot of work experience and community stuff as well. I wondered if you wanted to just talk to us a little bit about that so we can get a, a wider scope as well of obviously this is massive for the industry, but also in the in the Liverpool community, you guys are really important as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to, uh, you know, we do have, um, I don't particularly, this to me isn't about ad lib, it's a much bigger picture than ad lib, but just on that once a little bit, you know, we do actually have a worldwide reputation for how we bring youngsters into the industry and whether that be someone we discover as an incredible talent of 14 who's come and done a bit of work experience or whether it's the first job for somebody who's just completed their degree at the community college, LIPA, um, or any other city organization that you would like to mention. Um, but yeah, we have our own programs in here as to how we take that talent at whatever stage it is and develop it and bring it through. But in all that, we do provide lots and lots of work experience opportunities for anything that's educational in the city, from the schools right the way through to um, all the, the uh, courses run by, as I say, the John Moores, the Lipper, the whatever but there's lots and lots of work experience opportunities provided here and that's that's people's chance to shine you know so we've got i could tell you stories of at least probably up to 10 14 year olds who came here on a week's work experience who we recognize as people who yeah they're living and breathing this at 14 and the second they leave school left school at 16 they were here and in you know most cases when people do that They've already told you all of God knows how many times by the time they're 20. 
Whereas, you know, there's others who've gone through the whole educational thing that they come out at 23 and still been 27, 28 before they've reached that point. So there's different routes and different ways. And we facilitate the individual as opposed to um, a, a, a full on route, if you like, in. But regarding providing that work experience opportunity, we'll do it for anybody and everybody. And yeah, as I say, it is recognized locally by the colleges and unis, and it's certainly recognized around the world how many um, young engineers and technicians have come through with a dodgy accent like mine. <laughs> I think that's the thing as well, especially with this week, in terms of what's happened with the algorithms, exam results as well, I think it's quite uh, important to highlight the different routes that people can take and that actually the arts isn't just like a soft subject that you just sort of do because of other things. It's actually a really valuable, important and very hard um, thing because I tell you, if you put me in front of a tech board, I'd certainly be like, and where's the on switch? You know, it's, 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 a, it, it's a very sort of, you know, valuable, but also, you know, a difficult thing to do and uh, it's, it's not a, a soft thing to do and to have different routes and to support people who are able and have that kind of aptitude towards that kind of thing and to value that aptitude in a way that perhaps academia doesn't always do, I think is a really vital and important thing to have. So, I mean, it is. I, I do think more and more moving forward, though, you know, I do think education was as outdated as, the, as I believe a lot of people's opinion is of our industry from the point of view of, well, what are you looking for then? Do you just want the, the, the guys who can just lift boxes? Do you want the, you know, do you want those kind of characters? And, well, no, actually, I need geologists. I need the guy who's, who's, who's you know, an awkward physics student, someone who's, who's got that genuine enthusiasm. Because wherever you come into this industry, you know, whether it be the art side, whether it be the production side, you're not going into a job. If you're going into a job, go and do something else. You're walking into a way of life. And if you're not prepared to walk into that way of life, then go and do something else. And your social circles wind up being the people that you start working with. And ultimately, because you're all like-minded uh, more often than not, and you have the common goals and the common interests. So the fact that it is as demanding and um, uh, uh, it, it's, its requirements are massive in comparison to any other job, you're only doing it because you love doing it. Because if you don't love doing it, You'd hate it. It's, just... <laughs> it's a fair point. <laughs> Entirely, yeah, I, I often have that conversation with people when they ask me what I do, because I have a, a range of things that I do, but I do a lot of work at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I do a lot of work in sort of more theatre based production stuff. But trying to explain the Edinburgh Fringe Festival to someone who's never worked or attended it as to why I like to do it is, is something that never makes me sound like I'm saying. It's that no. thing of, well, I go yeah, up and well, I, I live there for two months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I live there for a month and a half and I build venues out of nothing and then we don't sleep and then we put on some massive shows and then we rip it all down again. And they're yeah. like, and it's fun. Yes, it's amazingly fun. It's incredible. But it's that, that thing of actually um, that a lot of people don't realise about what we do is the passion behind everything that we're doing and actually that we make a lot of sacrifices, I think, to do what we do. But we do that because we care so much about what we're doing but now i feel we're being asked to make more sacrifices than we are being able to retreat yeah, it's it's the camaraderie and sense of achievements of doing an event from either an open field to something that a couple of hundred thousand people might come to and enjoy and then turning it back into an open field at the end of it yeah or just you know on a touring basis you know people would have no idea that if they've been to a show at the um mns arena in liverpool um, that all that equipment that was in that roof and on that floor that day will be in Manchester tomorrow. It's the same stuff, really. You know, it's like, how many trucks was that then? You know, it, it's, it's the ignorance. I, was, I used that word a couple of times now. But the ignorance towards our skill set is immense. And it's nobody's fault, by the way. I'm not calling people ignorant when I say that at all. It's, it's like I said before, it's because we've been brilliant. Yeah. Not because yeah. they're wrong, you know, it, it certainly isn't that. Um, and I, I think, I, I do think that, as I say, part of a campaign moving forward is for the public to just have a little bit of awareness of what we do. And if they do want to see shows and gigs again moving forward or go to events again in the future, if we're not here, they won't be. 
you know, so it is that supply chain right the way across the board is is critical. Absolutely. Yes. That's it. That's entirely it. Um, so the the thing we're sort of asking everyone who who comes on this this podcast to sort of to to have a think about and to share with us is say if you you manage to get to sit down with with Oliver Dowden, our, our culture secretary, with Rishi Sunak, our chancellor, and with Boris Johnson, our uh, prime minister, um, and you could you could sit down and you could explain to them the problems we're facing and how you think they could approach fixing it or specifically how they could fix it what what would you say to those people well i think first of all what you'd have to do is is try and understand what it is that they'd want to understand yeah. and i don't i think the first thing that you'd want them to try and do is to actually accept that the industry itself is incredibly technical and very technically gifted and if this industry went on strike for 24 hours they couldn't publish anything anywhere. They wouldn't be on the television. There'd be no radio. There'd be no kind of events whatsoever. If if it's it's understanding its scope to start with, because its scope is massive. So that's the first thing I try and get them to understand. The second thing is I try and get rid of the myth of what they think we are. So you know, again, a gang of roadies throwing some stuff on a stage is not where this industry sits. Again, the people who do that job is a critical part to it and of it, and I don't want that to be um, undermined in any way, shape or form, or even again underestimated. It's part of it, but that's part of that 500 that we were talking about before. Um, but it's, it's, it's the appreciation of the technology, the skill sets that are involved. But again, that doesn't mean a great deal to a government. The bit that will really make the difference is what is its value? And I think if we look at, you asked me a question earlier about what does it meant and where does it sit? I don't think there is a true appreciation of the value that I would say the live sector brings to the full picture. So, you know, it's, it's not cracking the pavement. It's absolutely not cracking the pavement. And I would have them to be say to them, it's 50% of the sector at least. And while it's fantastic, and it is, that theatres are being supported, and all the heritage centres, which work for a lot of the tourism, are supported, and small budgets being set aside for the small venues, which is great. All that's really good. But the 1.57 million, as it's been allocated at the moment, um, is looking like it's been structured in such a way um, and I'm going to use that word allegedly here, but it looks like it's been structured in such a way that it is aimed at the theatres and the heritage centres and the small venues. Um, and this sector that we're talking about, the invisible sector, um, which is, you know, 50% of the income and, and probably considerably more of the profit margin, because that sector includes all your festivals, all your promoters, all your live touring, at, any level you want to mention but certainly at arena level and it includes all the corporate sector and the corporate sector again is lots of massive massive events that are going on in arenas that aren't for public notice or consumption so they're not even aware that they're going on but also makes up part and parcel of our sector so when you roll all that together that sector is the sector that isn't supported annually by arts funded which venues can be and heritage centres can be so it's commercially viable it's paying taxes without support all year round it's playing substantial amounts of VAT substantial amount of PAYE it's also the sector that is taking all the personal risk it's all the sector that is heavily investing in equipment all the time at its own expense and risk the value of our sector to the banks is a piece of work that's being done at the minute because I'm going to suggest that the amount of leasing from your small one-man one operation who's just saved up to get a deposit on a £20,000 mixing console to Adlib that will be spending £6 million a year on capital investment all through leasing facilities. If you take that by the thousands of small companies and the other companies who are much bigger than Adlib, then the amount of money being generated and spent is phenomenal. And you may look at us and say, well, you're not a key industry to support, really, are you? You're not that important. Well, OK, I can understand how a lot of industries may be a little bit more important. But 
will give you that. But actually, we're worth this, and that amount of money that we're generating over here that's paying in taxes is supporting you in that, that, and that. So maybe we are important. So even if you even if you don't value us here because you don't understand what relief we give to people and what sense of enjoyment that we provide and life memories that we give, if you don't value that, then at least value the money. And I think that's exactly where we need to be going with all this at the minute. So that's Fantastic. what I'd say. Brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. That's it. And I, I always, yeah, I always reflect on the fact that I wonder how many, um, how many politicians realise how much their party yeah. conferences are supported by people like us and what we do and how much they're reliant on us turning the lights on in the venue and, and making sure their microphones work and, and doing all of that sort of stuff as well. And, and these are the things that people don't see. There are, there are the three things that, I, that we need to ask for. I, I didn't, re I should have really finished this. So in saying all that, there's the three key things that need to be asked for at the minute. One, the, the acceptance of the skill set of our people and the acceptance that despite the fact that you've said you've opened theatres, you haven't. And the only way our sector returns is when social distancing is a thing of the past. Now, how that happens, whether it be uh, a vaccine or whether it be it's under control, that's up to debate, obviously. But ultimately, until such time as mass gatherings are allowed, all employees of companies of this sector must be supported by the government. We know the stop in furlough, so just create something sector-based that obviously you're telling us we can't work. So morally, at least you've got to be supporting us. Exactly the same applies to the freelancers. I do believe the freelancers need to be categorized in such a way, because I thought that I'm almost convinced that the government will look at the freelancer as a one-man band who is either an electrician or a plumber or this, that, and the other. Our industry-specific freelancers need to be recognised as that and supported in exactly the same way as I've just mentioned for the, for the um, uh, employed people. And the next biggie is that our sector will have been out from March 23rd, as discussed before, till whenever it goes back. And whenever it goes back at the minute is potentially people are guessing April and May next year. So we will have been out considerably longer than any other sector. Therefore, our losses by percentage are going to be far, far greater than any other sector. And the government needs to recognise that and provide lo loans. Sorry, not loans. They need to provide grants rather than loans to recognise those additional losses that our sector will have gone through because our sector will, as soon as that switch is turned back on, will move so much faster than any other sector because people are chomping at the bit to go and do anything. Artists are chomping at the bit to get out there and we've got warehouses full of gear that we want to get out there. It will return quickly. It will return as quick as it takes a promoter to get the ticket sales and the billboards up. And then once that's in and gone, bang, it will move very, very quickly. So to not support us, knowing that the return is going to be fast, to know it was the fastest growing sector in the UK in 2018, it really defies logic for me. So it's supporting businesses with grants, not loans, freelancers until the sector is allowed in, sector-specific freelancers till the sector is back in, and the same with employees and businesses. They're the three things that we need to do. Thank you for listening to The Voices Project. This podcast is produced by March for the Arts. The Voices Project is an open platform for anyone who is involved in any way with the arts to share their thoughts, feelings and experiences of art in the current crisis. If you would like to participate and share your voice, you can find out how to do that by visiting our website, www.marchforthearts.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review, subscribe or share with a friend.